events hereafter might have never happened if Samuel Brinkley hadn't stopped to look at his face in the old mirror by the cabin window. The point is, this was the first time in seven weeks that he had been allowed to glance at a looking glass. That's because he had been having a long, hard tussle with typhoid, and because Tennessee mountain folks know, even if those city doctors don't, that sick people who see themselves in a glass will die. Samuel was able to put his clothes on, and Mary, as attentive a nurse as she was an energetic wife, guided his steps towards the window and the pillow-padded chair by the chimney. It's safe for you to take a look at your whiskers, Pa, she said good-humoredly. You put me in the mind of one of those clowns that we'd seen that time at the circus. The fever-wasted mountaineer surveyed his image in the cracked and dingy glass. His two months of coal black beard threw into startling contrast the pallor of his sunken jaws and his white forehead. He stroked the thick stubble slowly. Mary, he piped weakly. It peers for a sick man. I've raised a right smart crop of whiskers. My granddad had a master beard on him. Do you recall ever seeing him? Yes, Paul, Mary replied. I remember seeing your granddaddy lots of times when I was a gal. I used to be scared to meet up with him on the road. His big black whiskers, they look plump scary to a youngin. Now come on and sit a while while I make up your bed. Samuel sat down on the cushioned chair where the sunshine fell greatly upon his weak frame. It was good to gaze again upon the friendly ruggedness of the waters of No Business Creek that ran just across the holler. He would soon be out there once more among the other mountaineers who ran the puffing engines and fed the whining saws at the lumber mill. Again, he rubbed his scrubby cheeks and chin. Mary, he said, let me have one more look see in that glass. I've got a mind to just let him keep growing a spell. Granddad always said, a good beard looked mighty fine on a fella. I reckon you can let him stay a while, Paul. The mountain woman replied, you're sort of whopper jawed anyway, and a beard would set right well on you until you get all fleshed up some. I ain't willing, though, to let you grow it big and bristly like your grandsire's was. The young'uns will be scared of you for sure. And yes, that's why I crave to raise me a good set of whiskers, Mary. There was a plane of eagerness in the weak voice. In this day and time, young'uns need to have more fear and respect for those in authority, especially their pa, which the good book plainly says he ought to be the head of the family. There's too many women and children nowadays, a ribbon and a tearing and a running, hither and yonder, a pleasure in themselves. Us men and fathers, we should be tending to our duty of raising hair on our chins and our chest, like the old patriarchs of the scriptures. This bit of social and domestic philosophy brought no audible response from the busy wife, who was briskly fixing up the bed, and Samuel failed to see the momentary smile that lit up her stoic face like the swift glow of heat lightning on a summer evening cloud. Now, Paul, get back in bed, she directed, in the quiet way of one accustomed to being obeyed. I've tidied up your straw tick, and I put a clean slip on your pillow. Now I'll make you a little mess of squirrel broth for your supper. In a few weeks, the gang at the sawmill welcomed Samuel back to his place as operator of the cutoff saw. And as his softened muscles grew back to their wanted hardness, his beard also grew. The mill hands made it the subject of much banner and even threatened to impress the services of Tony Tinker, the rough and ready camp barber. Now Samuel, he was extremely sensitive to banner, a stalwart of body he was, and a good hand on any job in the woods. But inwardly, he was a shrinking soul, albeit far from him to admitting that fact to anyone, even himself. He secretly nursed the worthy ambition to be known as a domineering, hard-boiled brute of a man. Particularly did he envision himself as lord and master of the domestic kingdom consistent of Mary and his eight young children of assorted ages and sizes. If he was more touchy on one point than all others, it was on the question of his status as head of the house of Samuel. Now Mary, be it said, was outwardly all that a mountain man's helpmate should be. In proper highland fashion, she worked her man's crops, cooked his meals, spread his table, and when he had a guest, 
she served as waitress, silently renewing the biscuit and keeping the coffee cups full and remaining elsewise alert but invisible in the kitchen. Nevertheless, she came from the McDavick stock, which wasn't altogether in her favor. The McDavicks were regarded by the no-business Creek folk as a woman bedeviled a lot of men persons. It was even rumored that some of the men in that unfortunate clan had to do the milking and the churning. And, if the truth must be told, Samuel himself had his moments of doubt as to Mary's full and unseen acceptance of the apostolic doctrine of wifely submission. Mary had a way about her at times, to say the least. Despite the jesting of the mill hands, Samuel held fast to his resolve to let him grow a spell. He had a feeling that a full beard was going to enhance his dignity as a lord of creation. He never dreamt that he was suffering from an inferiority complex, but he did suspect that his neighbors were whispering that Mary wore the britches in their household. And sure enough, the young and inspiring beard was already adding the marks of distinction to his otherwise unimposing face, and he could see that himself. It soon became apparent, too, that the beard, or something, was working a noticeable change in the attitude of his fellow men. The gang had suddenly taken to calling him Sir, and once or twice, a new man had even addressed him as Mr. Samuel. It really paid to look rugged, just as his granddad had said. Months went by and lengthened into years in the slow, slinking way that old time has in the mountains. But as for Samuel Brinkley, he seemed to defy time, and somehow he got away with it. He looked scarcely a day older, and his well-knit frame remained just as straight and stout as ever. And his beard, well, it was a beard now. In fact, it had come to be accepted by the general public as part of the order of nature. For him, to be sure, it had begun to assume some aspects of a major problem. For one thing, it got in his way as he deftly caught the pine boards that came endlessly by the conveyor rolls to the cutoff saw, and it was really dangerous. It's sorta of risky around a sawmill, he admitted. I heard the other day a fellow over at the north camp got too close to a belt, and before he could say scoot, he lost a plum beautiful beard and most of the face that it growed on. Now Samuel's was certainly not a beard of the common garden variety. It once was blacker than midnight in a coal mine and glossier than a crow's wing. But now it was a beautiful silver, like the prophets of old. It fell like a curtain well below his knees. That is, when he allowed it to fall, as he sometimes did for the edification of admiring friends. Most of the time, though, he carried it folded carefully in a black satin pouch that he wore on the inside of his vest underneath his coat. And soon, he was a local legend as he passed through the No Business Creek community carrying his trailing beard in his specially made pocket. One Saturday, a score of mill hands off duty were loafing in the company store watching the valiant but futile efforts of a patient medicine salesman who tried to land a fat order from Dan Bickett, the canny manager of the camp store. No, there ain't nothing I'm needing today, drawled the soft-spoken manager. These fellas around here, they're a right healthy lot. And when they're ailing, they mostly stick to salts, balsam oil, and sassafras. Now just a moment, Mr. Bickett, the fluent salesman came back undaunted. I was about to overlook one thing, one of the most necessary preparations for any well-stocked store. And as you know, there's a great deal of baldness among timbermen. Now I have one of the best remedies for baldness ever offered to the public. Dr. Flimber's Peerless Hair Restorer and Scalp Invigorator. Endorsed by clergymen and recommended by the press everywhere. Just one dollar a bottle. Let me send you a trial order, Mr. Bickett. Say, mister, a burly teamster sang out. Is that stuff guaranteed to raise whiskers too? Why, the surest thing you know, came the quick response. It'll grow burn sides on a billiard ball and chin whiskers on a doorknob. Try a bottle, my good man. Only one dollar. No, I ain't hunting no more troubles than what I've got, the man retorted. 
It already takes a brand new razor to get me fixed up Sunday morning now. But there's another fella here who's trying awful hard to get some chin tassel sprouted. I reckon you could sell him a whole case of it if it's got a guarantee to it. Soon, a chorus of other onlookers chimed in agreement of this opinion. Someone hurried out to find Samuel and returned presently with the shaggy sawmill man in tow. Samuel? Dan Bickett drawled. We've been telling this man here about you trying to start up a beard, and he claims he's got the growingest stuff there is to rub on your feeble efforts to grow a beard and speed him up a little bit. The salesman took one look at the mountaineer and joined heartily in the laugh that went around. He thought he saw the joke. Really, though, he hadn't seen half of it. To be more accurate, he had only seen 12 inches or so of Samuel's beard that terminated at the top of the invisible black pouch. He didn't even suspect that a half yard or so laid cold within. Well, my friend, he remarked, I'll hand it to you. You've made a fine beginning in beard production. But if you start using Dr. Flimberg's peerless hair restorer and scout invigorator at once, in less than six months, you'd have a beard that would reach your knees. See here, I'm going to make you as fair a proposition as you had ever heard. You take three bottles of this tonic and use it according to the directions, and I'll be back this way next spring. And if you're entirely satisfied, you pay me three dollars. And if you're not, you pay me nothing. And that's not all. If you do use this treatment faithfully, and you don't have your beard cut before I get back, I'll have your picture made for our advertising department, and we'll pay you a certain amount for every inch of beard that you grow as a result of our remarkable product. Well, how much will you pay? The shrewd hillsman queried. Well, let's suppose we make it one dollar for every full inch of new growth by that time. How does that strike you? And Samuel almost gasped, but his face betrayed no hint of his astonishment. I reckon that'd be reasonable enough, he casually replied. And how long do you judge it is now, mister? Oh, I have nothing to measure it with, but I'd say it looks from this distance to be about 12 inches. The mill hands would have torn the house down with their shouts had Dan Bickett not forestalled their outburst with a warning wink. Samuel's face was as solemn as a veteran politician. Well, mister, it might be a smidgen longer than that, he said soberly. That's all right, my friend. I see you want to be strictly honest, but what's a little matter of an inch or so between friends? We'll have these men here as witnesses that when I come back, I'll pay you one dollar for every inch of beard that you've grown above 12 inches. That's satisfactory, isn't it? Well, I'm satisfied if you are, mister, Samuel replied, and the salesman hurried away to catch the train. The busy weeks passed quickly. Samuel used the hair restorer and the scalp invigorator faithfully according to the directions. For a whole week, he was fired with determination. He was going to be the proud owner of the longest, thickest beard ever boasted in all the glorious history of Appalachia. Had he not been promised, in the presence of good men and true, that he should have his picture published? Fame stood knocking at his door. The restorer and the invigorator, however, proved to be a foul-smelling stuff and messy to apply. On the sixth day, he took the remaining two and seven-eighths bottles and threw them in a gully behind his cabin. As for the beard, though, it continued to grow. It needed no restorer and no invigorator. It flourished like grass after a summer rain. Before the summer had come again, Samuel had attained the goal of his towering ambition. His beard, when he chose to let it fall at full length, to the delight of gawking onlookers, it trailed a good six inches on the floor. And Samuel was a big man, six feet two inches tall, standing in his socks. And it was a wondrous sight to see. The eventful day came when the medicine salesman arrived again in the camp and made his way to Dan Bickett's camp store. No, there ain't nothing I'm needing today, Dan muttered. I reckon, though, you'll be having a settlement with Samuel Brinkley today, won't you? You remember the fella that you gave that hair medicine to, and you was going to pay him for his whiskers if he was able to raise any. Oh, yes, I do recall him, the salesman replied. Sure, I'll be glad to see how he's come out with it. I wonder where he is. Well, he'll be here in a jiffy, Bickett answered. A crowd of roughnecks filed in, with Samuel marching at the head of the pack and trying to appear as calm and casual as if this wasn't the great day for which he had waited for many months. The salesman came forward, extending a welcoming hand, 
Well, Mr. Brinkley, I'm glad to see you again. I guess you've come to close our little deal about that fine beard, huh? Yeah, I reckon I'm about as nigh ready as I'm likely to get, he replied in an offhand manner. Well, let's see, began the salesman. I believe we were to start with the 12 inches you had last year and measure the growth since then, weren't we? That was the sense of it, I believe, mister. Well, Mr. Brinkley, I hope you use the restorer faithfully, and you have several inches of healthy, vigorous growth to show for your efforts. Well, sir, I did the best I could with it, and I reckon nobody could have done a better job than that. No, indeed, my friend. Now step over here by this window, and we'll take this yardstick and measure the exact length of your beard today. Samuel moved to the window. The spectators gathered around in a silent circle. Samuel opened his coat and fumbled a moment with the straps that held his pouch in place. Then, something soft, silver and black, and shiny rippled to the floor. The lanky mountaineer rose to his full six feet two, his head up high like an ancient pirate. Nevertheless, a foot or more of the beard fell down to the rough floorboards. The crowd could hold it no longer. With ear-splitting roars and shrieks, they fairly lifted the ceiling off the old storeroom. <laughs> they laughed until they had to sit down on whatever came handy. Counters, nail kegs, and some on the floor itself. The official representative of Dr. Flemberg's Peerless Restorer rose to the occasion and proved himself a game sport. He knew the joke was on him, but he wanted the crowd to get their money's worth. He was going to get his, and it wasn't going to cost him anything. And his chemical company, well, they were going to get some real advertising. For half a minute, he stood in speechless amazement, as he knew he was expected to do. And then, once the uproar subsided, he grasped the hand of the big woodsman. Oh man, you win. You've got the prize beard of Tennessee. You've given the finest demonstration of what Flimberg's Restorer will do when used regularly and persistently. I'm going to pay you $50 in cold, hard cash right now without even putting a yardstick to your beard. Let's shake on it. Samuel extended a rough hand while the body of men exploded with a new outburst of sheer joy. Now hold on, I'm not done yet, the plucky salesman shouted, waving his arms to quiet the racket. My good friend, why waste your time as a common laborer on this sawmill job? With you as living proof to the marvelous efficiency of this great hair tonic. I can sell a carload of it in every town from Bristol to Chattanooga. I'm gonna make you a proposition. You go with me this very afternoon to Johnson City and we'll start out on a partnership basis. You'll make more money than you ever saw in your life. We'll ride in Pullman's, pull up at the swell hotels, and together we'll set atop the entire world. Just like that, Samuel Brinkley was destined to become world famous far beyond the walled-in world of mountains in Appalachia. Photos of his miraculous beard appeared in newspapers and magazines all over the world. Old Sam, a mountain man who had never been more than 10 miles beyond No Business Creek, went on to travel 44 states in America and Canada and Mexico. He was featured in many traveling circuses as a man with the longest beard in the world with the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus and John Robinson's and Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And now, you know the amazing story of Samuel Brinkley. Till next time, my friends, let me know what you think about this story in the comments below. And don't forget to hit that like button.